Turing Lecture, we will have another special lecture, the Lindau Lecture. Um, it is a lecture given by a Nobel laureate who will normally attend the Linda Nobel laureate meetings. This year's Lindau Lecture will be given by Edward Moser. He's a psychologist and neuroscientist. He has a professorship for psychology at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim. And he shared the 2014 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine with Maybrit Moser and John O'Keefe for their work identifying the place cells that make up the brain's positioning system. My positioning system tells me to leave the stage and give the floor to Edward Moser. Good morning. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, I will, uh, as you understand, talk about the brain. And I will focus particularly on space, but also somewhat on temporal organization of brain activity. Um, my reason for focusing on the brain's space system, or the brain system for uh, helping us find out where we are and how we get from one place to another, is not only that I think this is an interesting problem by itself, but more uh, the fact that uh, among uh, the high-level brain functions, uh, this is perhaps the one, or at least one of very few, where we can uh, describe activity in some mechanistic detail and where there is some theoretical background that guides our investigations. So, uh, as you heard in Dr. Benjo's talk, um, also the brain is very hard to access, and particularly the cortex, because neural codes, first of all, occur across uh, 100 billion neurons. And these neurons are very small, particularly the connections between the neurons, synapses, where information lies. And the code is uh, distributed, intermixed, and combinatorial, and definitely we have a curse of dimensionality. So it has been very, very hard to pick up activity from the brain that can be related to any function uh, in the cortex. But there is some exception for the brain's navigation system, which you will understand very soon, that uh, makes it possible to access, even if it is kind of in the middle of the brain, far away from sensory inputs and motor outputs. So where in brain is this? Well, for such a complex function, of course, almost the entire cortex is involved. Uh, but still, there are two areas that are particularly important. And historically, focus has, has been on the hippocampus. So hippocampus is in your medial temporal lobe. It's not on the surface as indicated here, but actually more on the inner side where the cortex goes, curves around on the inside. But nonetheless, this is cortex, an old part of cortex, and uh, it has been investigated intensively for the last uh, 60, 70 years, since a patient got uh, uh, surgery in this brain area, and uh, it was found to play a major role in daily life memories, so this patient then lost his memories. But it was also found later on that the same brain area and the same cells are actually important also for, uh, for representing our position in the environment. So position and memory are very strongly linked, and uh, a lot has been learned about both in studies of hippocampus. More recently, uh, another area has come into the picture, and that's the entorhinal cortex, which uh, in many ways is a gateway between hippocampus and the rest of the cortex. So the entorhinal cortex connects the hippocampus with the rest of the cortex, all areas of cortex almost, but it also has functions on its own, as we will see very soon. But this is hard to study in humans um, for obvious reasons. So most of the work has been done in rats and mice um, for many reasons, but one of them being that especially rats have a uh, hundred years of experimental history, so we know quite a lot about rat behavior and rat brains, 
uh, and mice are not all that different. So now we have transgenic mice, so that has also caused uh, a lot of uh, advance in our understanding of these systems. But their brains and their cortices even are organized very, very similarly to um, the human cortex. Of course, they are much smaller, but the cells they consist of, the connections, the functions of the cells are very similar. And they are also, it turns out, very important for helping rats and mice to navigate, which they are very good at and actually do in many ways the same way as we do. So a major advance happened in 1971 when John O'Keefe used uh, microelectrodes. These are very thin electrodes. At that time, probably 30, 40, 50 microns wide. They're much thinner now. Um, that he put into the hippocampus of uh, rats. So you see a rat brain here, and the red is the uh, hippocampus, the blue is the entorhinal cortex. And uh, not really knowing uh, what he was going to find, uh, he uh, started recording from rats with uh, uh, hippocampus electrodes connected to an oscilloscope and a computer, and started listening to their activity and found that these cells in the hippocampus indicated the position of the rat as it was running around freely in the environment. So I want to show you such an experiment. Uh, what you see here is a rat in a box. The box is one by, meet, one, by one meter large. You see it from above. The rat is, uh, I'm going to start the movie very soon, but you will see a rat running around uh, chasing small chocolate pieces. So the rats like chocolate, so that can keep them running for, for long, long, long times. And uh, of course, we do that to have the rat visit every possible place in the box in every possible direction. And at the same time, um, we record activity from electrodes that are inserted into the brain, so we can pick up the electrical discharges of neurons in the hippocampus and uh, through a cable that is connected for the occasion and then uh, convert the electrical uh, changes, the voltage changes to a sound so we can listen to the activity of a single cell in the hippocampus. So we're going to do that now and at the same time as we hear the sounds of that cell, you'll also see red dots appearing on the screen when, whenever the uh, cell is active. So this is one single cell in the hippocampus, typical cell, and you see that this cell is, uh, well the red dots, uh, uh, doesn't quite match the sound, but anyway, uh, the, the point is that you see the, um, see the cell being active only when the rat is in the upper left part of, uh, of the box. And um, since, the rat, since this cell is active only in one particular place, it was then called a place cell by O'Keefe. And that uh, can also be illustrated by a, a color code here. So red is high activity, blue is low activity, and this is the box seen from above. So different cells in the hippocampus have different place fields. That means they are active in different parts of the box. And there are many hundreds of thousands of these cells in a rat brain. So uh, you can imagine that at every possible place in the box, there's a different combination of active cells. And that combination is unique across the environment so that uh, anyone, computer or brain, uh, area that listens to the combination of active cells can figure out exactly where the rat is at any given time. And um, because this implicitly uh, in, has in or contains a code for location in the environment, then uh, a few years later O'Keefe together with his colleague Lynn Nedell suggested that uh, this was the basis of a neural map for space. So such a map had been proposed uh, 20, 30 years earlier by Edward Tolman based on purely psychological uh, observations of rats. But um, this was the first time that anyone actually found something that might correspond to a neural map of space. A map of space that contains information about your coordinates, but also about the experiences you make at different positions in the environment.
So this was in the 1970s, and uh, more was learned about place cells, but then another major um, discovery was made in the mid or late 1980s, when Jeff Taub and Jim Rank found uh, that in a different brain region, called the pre subiculum which is uh, uh, somewhat outside the hippocampus, but uh, still connected to the hippocampus, cells in that region fired or were active in relation to the direction that the rat was facing in the box. So imagine again, a rat is running around in the box, and each time the rat's head faces a certain direction, could be in the east or west or south, or, but only, of course, in relation to the room frame, then the cell is active. So one example here, this cell is active only when the rat's head direction is about uh, 300 degrees in the room, and otherwise totally silent. Other cells could be active at other directions, and again, in combination, this provides a very precise code of the rat's instantaneous direction. So, there's a code for position, there's a code for direction, but how are they linked? That was a big question at that time, and also how are they generated? People also started thinking about that. But it was uh, motivation enough for us to start recording in a third brain area called the entorhinal cortex, the area that I showed on the initial slide in blue. And this is in a rat brain seen from behind, and uh, the area in color here is the entorhinal cortex, and we recorded up here because this is the area that is most strongly connected to hippocampus. So the reason for starting to record there was first that this uh, is, uh, the connect, uh, connects the place cells with the rest of the cortex, and uh, we found already then that place cells probably cannot be the source of uh, the place code, uh, so it made sense to go one, go one step out. And also, the fact that this uh, brain area connects the direction cells in the pre with the place cells in the dorsal hippocampus. It might be an interesting place to look if you want to find out how they are integrated. And what we observed there are cells that uh, are somewhat like the place cells in the hippocampus, in the sense that they are active at particular locations. So here you see again the box from above. In grey is the trace of the rat as it is running around in the box for 30 minutes. And each black dot is the location where one particular cell in this brain area is active. So can, you can see they are active at uh, distinct positions, but multiple positions and those positions form a very, very regular pattern that uh, stretches across the entire environment. So the pattern is indicated here when I put these red lines on top. You can see it's, uh, it's really a repeating hexagonal pattern uh, that crosses the entire uh, space, like a grid, and for that reason we call these cells uh, grid cells. And uh, there are many, many grid cells in the brain area, so this shows when you record several of them at the same time. So these are electrodes, each of them approximately 17 micrometers wide. So uh, if you are above the cells you record, then you can imagine you record the blue and the red and the green one here. And this is then the grid pattern that you see of each of them. And you will see that, uh, that uh, each of them have grid patterns, but they are shifted in X, Y location, or they have different phase, as we call it. And uh, this is quite typical, that there is not very much, at least, uh, very, very little uh, organization with phase. That means that at any position in the, in the anatomical environment, any position in the brain, uh, in the entorhinal cortex, you have all phases represented. So often we call this salt and pepper uh, organization. However, there's also, there is some other organization in the sense that uh, the s frequency or the scale of the grid changes from the top of the brain to the bottom. So the colored area here is again the entorhinal cortex. This is the brain, a side view of the brain. This is the hippocampus. This is the entorhinal cortex. You start from the top and then you have a high frequency of grids and then the frequency uh, goes down and you get wider and wider spacings as you get uh, lower. So. Um, but this is not a continuous gradient, it actually consists of quite discrete modules, at least five, probably it's in the order of ten, uh, uh, where you have uh, first one group of very small scale uh, 
grid cells, and then another one uh, with a higher scale, and then a third one uh, with a larger scale, and so on, where the distance, if this is a box where the rat runs, the distance is here maybe 34 centimeters between the clusters, and down here it's several uh, meters. And these, uh, are, uh, these modules, as we call them, they are organized, uh, they're actually overlapping quite a lot in, in, in the brain, but nonetheless very, very clearly uh, uh, separated. And uh, a funny thing is that there is actually a quite rigid scale relationship between them, so it's uh, organized like a geometric uh, uh, series where you uh, multiply by a constant factor to get from the smallest one to the scale of the next one, multiply again with the same factor to get the next one, and so, so on. And this is probably a way the brain organizes uh, its grid modules in order to, uh, to uh, represent location combinatorially with a minimum number of neurons. So, just to be sure we don't uh, believe this is uh, special for rats and mice, it's not. So this shows a phylogenetic tree for mammals, starting with a common ancestor down here. Humans are up there, rodents are here, and they all have these uh, grid cells and head erection cells and also several other types of cells. But uh, they are also present in uh, bats, which are on a completely different branch of the tree for mammals. They are found in a somewhat similar form, at least, in monkeys and in humans. So uh, these cells are present everywhere through mammals, and uh, it seems like this system was developed uh, a long time ago, at least in mammals, and, uh, and has been preserved. So then I wish to say a few words more uh, to now I'm getting more uh, speculative, but uh, an obvious question is how is this localized activity generated? I mean, that, this is really what we understand, because if we understand how this example of very, very clear patterns, how does this arise among neurons in the brain, that would put us on the track of understanding uh, neural computation or computation in neural circuits, because most likely what the brain does for one function, like space, is also used uh, in different ways for other functions. So um, that's why we put a lot of eff effort on this, but it is also a different, difficult question, because since this is circuit activity involving many hundreds, probably thousands of neurons that interact, you can't really easily infer it from uh, activity of small numbers of neurons. Um, at the levels we had until now. So until now, technology has only allowed us to record uh, a few dozens of cells at the very best. But this is totally changing now, and, uh, and we are now up in the many hundreds of thousands of cells at the same time. And that creates a new time where you actually can address mechanisms of uh, population activity. So I wish to just illustrate um, the me more mechanistic approach by uh, giving some examples and showing one type of models for localized activity that have been around for some decades now. And these are uh, the continuous attractor models that uh, have been introduced to explain both um, directional tuning in the head direction cells and uh, spatial tuning in place and later grid cells. So I will begin with the head direction cells because this is one dimensional and the easiest to understand. So the question is how can you get cells that are active only at a particular location uh, or only on a particular direction that you're facing your head and how can this activity then change as you turn around, how do different cells take over, and when you get around 360 degrees, the same cells take over again. So what is the neural basis of this? And the models that were introduced based on some more general models earlier on are as follows. So here you have cells, each cell is one circle here, and uh, they are connected in a ring. So they are organized according to their directional firing preference. So all those that are on the top here fire when the, are active when the, cell, when the head is pointing in the north direction. And then those that are, act, uh, are down here 
are those that are active when the rat is facing to the west and so on. So the point is that there are strong connections in this network between cells that have a similar function or similar tuning. So all those that have a north preference are strongly connected and the closer they are in the directional tuning, the stronger the connection. So this is enough then to create uh, excitations among similar cells, so it creates a bump of activity in this network. But of course, in order to control it, you also need inhibition. So the idea is that there is inhibition to those cells that are a little bit further away, like in a Mexican hat, it's often called a Mexican hat pattern. And uh, in that way, you can keep a bump of activity active without this spreading uncontrolled to the whole ring. And then the second element of those models is that there is some input from the outside about the actual movement of the head, so the direction or the velocity, uh, the, the angular velocity of the head comes into this network and when it, for example, uh, the rat's head is turning to the right or, or clockwise here, then this bump of activity also is shifted in, in the clockwise direction. When that input is counterclockwise, then the bump of activity because of this input is shifted the other way around. And then it can go around and uh, that then explains how you have a localized activity and how it can move around in space. And this remained very theoretical for a long time. It made predictions that were consistent with observations, but only very, very recently has such a network actually been observed in flies where there is such a direction, such a ring structure has been seen directly, activity moving around in this ring of connections between cells um, as predicted by these models, so that sort of puts some actuality on them. But these models were then is, uh, soon also extended to two dimensions. So the two-dimensional version is again that here you have cells, now imagine these are place cells, they're organized again according to where they're active in the environment and there are strong connections to those cells that are active, have place fields in the same place and then a wider ring of inhibition around, which is not shown here. And then you also have inputs about speed direction coming in and then moving this bump of activity around. So this was proposed for place cells in the mid-1990s. Uh, but um, since place cells, there's one problem with them, namely that they are different, they have different uh, maps or different combinations of activity in almost any different setting. So it would be quite uh, difficult or you would run out of cells if you would have to create such maps for every possible place in the environment. So um, when the grid cells came, that became more... Um, a more likely explanation because grid cells are similar everywhere. The only modification you have to make is to explain why do you get bumps of activity uh, in many places in the network and that's fairly easy because you have the bump of excitation uh, locally and then you have the ring of inhibition around and that ring of inhibition then uh, sort of prevents activity in each of the, these bumps that may arise in different places to sort of go into each other and of course the most uh, a stable pattern that you can get is a hexagonal pattern where all the bumps are as far away from each other as possible. So these are, uh, and then again you have uh, inputs about speed, direction that could move this activity around in the network. So these are theoretical models and uh, the predictions, uh, um, I mean, to really test them, one should observe this at the population level, recording from many, many cells in this network at the same time. But until then, uh, that hasn't been done yet, it's on, on the way. But uh, there are still some predictions that are consistent with this idea. And one is that um, if, uh, if these models really depend so strongly on the connections between the cells, much more than the sensory inputs from the outside, then they should perhaps be quite rigid in the sense that they persist across different environments. And so they do. So this shows just, uh, this is just a schematic illustrating the point. So here you have a rat running in one room and then in a second room and then back in the first room. And if you record three grid cells, for example, the phase relationship between them so 
uh, red is to the right of the blue and the green is below uh, the blue and the red. That pattern you see here is still preserved also in the other room and of course when you go back and this you can show with cross-correlation uh, studies that there is essentially just one pattern of grid cell organization that is maintained in every possible room or every possible condition where this rat is, is uh, behaving. And so this is what you would expect if it is really the intrinsic connectivity that matters so much. Of course, this is not proof of the models, far from that, but it is uh, enough to consider um, further experiments. And one other prediction is also that, um, that um, if it is so much dependent on the connectivity, then perhaps these grid patterns are even present in sleep when the, uh, the rats aren't really behaving and sensory inputs are, are kept away. And this is uh, some work uh, that was just uh, uh, published by Richard Gardner in our lab. Uh, and this shows, essentially shows the essence in this slide. So here you have two grid cells, one shown in red and one in black, and they have identical faces that are just on top of other, each other in this box. And to the right here, you see cross-correlation diagrams that shows the probability of um, activity in one of the cells given that the other cell is active. To the left, you see um, that cross-correlogram for when the rat is running in the box. And of course, this is what you would expect. So if cell number uh, one, for example, the black one, is active, then you would at this time, zero, see a high act probability of activity in the second cell as well. Uh, and that's what you see. You see a peak around zero seconds, and at other times uh, it is low. But um, the more interesting thing is that if you now take the same cell and ask what is the coactivity of those two cells in sleep, either in slow wave sleep or also in REM sleep, then you see that there's still a peak. That means that those cells that are active at the same time in the running state or when the rat is running in the box, those cells are also co-active in sleep. And opposite, those cells that are not active together, like here in the running state, they're also not active together when the rat is uh, sleeping. So that suggests it's essentially just one map that is preserved. And it's also shown here for a group of cells recorded. So what you see here is again time on the x-axis. Each row here is one cross-correlation diagram, but now um, the cross-correlation is color-coded, using a GLM here, uh, and the red is a high correlation, so peak like this, and uh, black is uh, a negative, that means a dip, like you saw in the other image. So this is what you get when you rank order the cells according to correlation in the running state. But if you then record the same cells in sleep, you can see it's essentially the same, which then means that for the whole population, the pairs of coactive cells are just the same when the rat is sleeping as when it's awake, which means these patterns uh, are likely not strongly dependent on any sensory inputs that come in. The actual position of activity in the network, uh, of course, is uh, when the rat is running, so the, the bumps of activity move around depending on, on where the rat is or what kind of speed inputs come up to the entorhinal cortex. But, um, but um, in general, uh, the, uh, the fact that there are such uh, locally localized activity points that uh, is probably created by the brain itself. Okay. So um, now in the... To, uh, in, this, in the last part of uh, the lecture, I want to uh, get to where we are now, questions we are working on now, because these models uh, are quite idealized, and one of the reasons is that there hasn't really been opportunities for testing them out. They are among the most pro uh, dominant uh, theoretical models in neuroscience, and, uh, but um, the uh, testing uh, has been lacking due to lack of tools. Um, but one of the questions that um, they don't handle very well is how is brain activity organized temporarily 
and what trajectories does activity take in multidimensional space as rats are running around in the environment. And this is work that we are doing now with especially Flavio Donato and Soldar Cogno and Horst Obenhaus, uh, who um, have been recording activity from the medial entorhinal cortex in mice in a very simplified uh, environment. So here, these mice, they run on a ball uh, in an environment that is completely dark. They run on the ball and they don't get forward, and that allows them then to be head fixed under a microscope that then allows us to image activity in the brain and specifically in the medial entorhinal cortex activity of many, many cells while the rat is running stationary um, in complete darkness with no particular goals. But uh, mice like running, so they just run and run and run, take a little break and run and run and run. And then, because this is so stereotypical behavior, it, um, it has some advantages if you want to study um, the organization of the uh, activity. So, just how is this done? Well, uh, a virus is injected when, uh, uh, soon after they are born into the medial entorhinal cortex. And this virus uh, causes the expression of fluorescent uh, calcium molecule, so G-CAMP. Uh, and uh, this uh, molecule, when expressed in the cells about two weeks later, then when we look at them under the microscope through a prism onto the uh, entorhinal cortex, we can look at the surface here, then we will see cells blinking uh, depending on the calcium level in the cells at, at the moment. So you see different blinks here, they are all different cells in the network um, that uh, is a bit hard to see, but uh, there are actually hundreds of cells in this uh, uh, image. So you can, in, and this calcium activity is a good approximation of the firing that you heard on the movie, the bop, 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 bop. It's just that um, it is, has a slightly slower dynamics, but uh, you can still infer the timing of the uh, so-called action potentials when the cells discharge. So while doing that, then uh, here's uh, now a recording for 200 plus cells over a time of somewhat more than 1,600 seconds. And each uh, black dot is when the cell is active. And here you see this is a typically what we see when you record from many cells in, in, in the brain area, in the cortex. Uh, it doesn't really look like there is much pattern here. But actually, uh, the, a nice thing about the entorhinal cortex is that activity is organized according along a, a low number of dimensions. So doing a, P, a principal component analysis makes some sense. So what um, Soledad in the lab uh, Cogno did was that she organized the cells uh, according to, uh, in um, sequentially here and uh, divided the time into small frames, approximately 150 milliseconds, for example. And then she did the PCA with uh, the cells as the variables and uh, the time frames as the observations. And then uh, she, for each, since she no load, then she organized or ranked the neurons, reorganized them according to how much they loaded on each of the components. For example, principal component one, the cell that had the highest loading on that component was then uh, put on the top and so on, depending on, on, on the loading. And if you did that, then suddenly a uh, much clearer pattern uh, appears. And you see that there's a repeating sequences of activity that uh, go occur all the time uh, during the recording. And if you magnify a little here, you see that it's actually sequences. So these aren't instances of simultaneous activity on and off, but it actually the activity runs through a long, long sequence of so many, many tens of seconds, and which go over and over and over again. And uh, it's also if you, the same that you see if you use uh, um, that if you use uh, non-parametric uh, methods for sorting uh, or reducing the dimensions, you get the same sequences repeating all the time. So how to quantify it? Well, it is possible then to, to, uh, to uh, create a matrix here where you divide not only time into bins, but you also bin the loadings onto the principal component, which might, for example, be principal component one. So let's say you divide it in 10, then uh, in uh, 
So for each uh, one tenth of the data, you can then uh, define uh, for each time frame is the activity higher than you would uh, uh, expect uh, just from the general background. And uh, then you can ask for each time frame which bin on this uh, uh, principal component uh, axis here is uh, the most active one. And you put a frame around the most active one for each time. And you already here see the example of this is not random in time. It actually is sequences that run through uh, time. And uh, this is what you then get if you plot uh, so-called transition matrices. So what is the probability of a transition from one PC bin to another PC bin? And you see a clustering along the diagonal, which then means that, uh, that most often activity transitions from one principal uh, component bin to one that is uh, very near it. And uh, see the same also if you plot it like graphs here. So these are again the PC bins uh, going from blue to yellow. And you see that most of the lines are, or transitions are actually between uh, neighboring uh, bins rather than randomly across uh, uh, the, the, the data as, uh, as if you keep the original sorting. And if you then have these uh, graphs like this, and then you go back to the data, analyze them frame by frame. So what we did here was that we looked for all possible transitions or all possible sequences among those that were significant here, looked for them in the data, and then marked, in this case with blue or with red, depending on they went, whether they went up and down, all those that matched a possible sequence in in this uh, uh, map here, and uh, then sorted, uh, did that for different time bins, anything from one second bins to 40 second bins, and then took uh, the one that gave the biggest difference from the chance level. And what we then found in, in the data, in almost all cases, is that uh, there are these long, long, long sequences that can last for, in some cases, up to two, three minutes that are significantly, uh, way significantly above chance that, uh, that happen when the mouse is running on this uh, wheel in this very stereotyped condition. And you see an extreme case here. So here the period is approximately uh, a few tens of seconds. So the activity sort of repeats itself all the time at a very, very regular uh, frequency. This frequency depends also on the age of the animal. In the beginning, there is nothing uh, really. So, but then when it gets about 20 years, uh, 20 days old and uh, up to 30, then it starts to organize itself and ends up with uh, uh, relatively short uh, periods of about some tens of seconds, which then coincides exactly with the timing of maturation of that network. So the network is f only fully re connected, really, when you get uh, these sequences here. And we're still looking, working on whether these really are sequences. Most likely, it seems now from data that they are actually circular, so they just go round and round and round in a loop when the rat is, uh, mouse is doing this very stereotypical uh, behavior and quite independently, apparently, of its actual behavior, whether it stops or runs. So I think what this tells us then is that uh, uh, this is a quite hardwired network that uh, generates uh, a lot of its activity through intrinsic mechanisms, intrinsic connections of the network that define when cells fire and in what sequences, and that, uh, well, sensory inputs may shape what directions it takes in the real world, but it is strongly dependent on uh, connectivity that is all already there that involves the whole range of, of cells in the uh, network. And finally, just to find out what this uh, happens when the rat actually is not only in such a stereotyped environment, but runs in uh, a real environment, then uh, we are now setting up experiments with, with the mice that have, uh, that have this very, very small microscope weighing two grams that can be put on the head of a mouse when the mouse is running around in the environment and this uh, microscope connects, uh, so this is uh, the work of Horst Obenhaus and Wei Jiang Song um, based on a microscope that uh, Song and colleagues developed in, uh, in, uh, at Peking University two years ago, which connects uh, 
this miniature microscope to a laser that is outside through a cable that uh, manages to keep the precision of pulses at the femtosecond level over two meters without distortion. Uh, so uh, this has, is quite some revolution because it el then allows two photon imaging of activity at very high resolution. So again here you see many cells active at the same time and now you also see the mouse running around in the box. Color indicates direction and uh, this is where the, rat, the mouse is in the box and at the same time you see uh, 200 something cells uh, uh, and the activity of these cells while the mouse is at different positions in the environment. And uh, this just shows again pretty good signal to noise ratio so you can see you can easily uh, capture the activity of uh, cells so they, in this case there were 259 cells that passed uh, a signal to noise ratio of 1 to 5 and those are then shown in the network here and uh, um, this is just the beginning so I mean I expect these methods to be in the many thousands very soon. So uh, this is the people who are involved in it so uh, all work together with my Brit Moser, uh, Richard Gardner for the sleep in particular, Flavio Donato, Soldat Kongno and Horst Obenhaus for the MEC trajectories and uh, also for, uh, the, uh, for the new work on, uh, on the um, uh, miniscopes and uh, Horst uh, Obenhaus and Weijan Song particularly and of course lots of people pay for this. So with that I want to thank you a lot for your attention. Well, thank you very much for this fascinating talk. Um, and again, we have time for probably two questions from the audience. Yes, Vint, I'll bring you the microphone. It's Vint Cerf, thank you so much for a really interesting talk. It seems to me that all the advances that we make in uh, physics and medicine, chemistry and biology are preceded by uh, new engineering systems for measuring things more accurately. And this wonderful interaction between scientific uh, speculation and engineering development is what uh, contributes to all these successes. So I'm wondering, what's the next thing you're going to try to measure? <laughs> uh. Well, I think we are at a point now where we actually are tipping over in a completely new phase of neuroscience because of, uh, I actually you put it very nicely, because it is, uh, it is because of the new technologies that allows us now to record many hundreds, thousands of cells at the same time, which you really need to when you want to study the networks. But it also, this can't go alone. It has to be, go together with theory and models, computational models of how the brain might work, uh, which uh, tries to reduce it and looks at the possible mechanism and ignore all the, the noise. And uh, those two, when they go together, that's what creates uh, advance. And uh, luckily enough, this brain uh, area and this brain system is one where this exists. So. I, uh, I think I, I will stay in that area and uh, uh, our idea is one of the quite, um, I mean we want really to see this attractor in uh, the activity of these uh, many cells at the same time. I mean sometimes I say it's like seeing the black hole f finally, right? So, so uh, uh, I think this is um, uh, because it has been very much inferences so far, but of course I also hope that uh, that this now will stimulate more theoretical development because that's actually what's lagging behind, I think. The, theory, the methods come all the time, but theory develops much more slowly and uh, there's a high need for more work on that. A short question complementing the previous one. How far we can go in this approach mapping high-level concepts into activities of cells? How much you think we can go in that direction? In which direction? A mapping concepts like oh. time, space oh, into yeah. activity of cells. Um, you mean technically how far we can go? Yes. Oh yeah, much further, I think. So, I mean, just within a few years it has now changed from dozens to a few hundreds and already there are recordings from a few thousands. So I think, uh, and definitely, what I think perhaps is more important than only increasing the numbers is to do multiple sub-circuits at the same time 
to see how they interact. Uh, so, um, so, but uh, but these devices all get smaller and smaller, so that uh, you can. Uh, I mean, this will continue for quite a while still. But of course, then you also need to develop the analytical tools as well at the same time, which okay. are totally new now. So the question is to what extent by studying only brain activity we can understand what happens at higher level of uh, language. Yeah, yeah. That's the question. Yeah, yeah. Now I, I think we can, but uh, what the limitation there, that's another limitation, because if we want to understand high level brain activity, we also need better methods for studying behavior. So the psychology is also lag lagging behind, because uh, quite often we don't really have good ways to measure, for example, how a mouse is planning, although definitely a mouse is planning where it's going, what's going to do. But uh, all these. Um, behaviors have to be quantified better. I think this will come, and machine learning is definitely important, actually, in order to, to do this nowadays. But uh, when this comes, I think that we can also understand much more advanced behaviors than, uh, than uh, space. Space is very simple, after all. <laughs>